Hello, in this video we're going to talk about education laws and policies, um, specifically those that have uh, made an impact on public schools. So the first one we're going to talk about is uh, related to laws and acts related to special education and giving um, rights to those with special needs. And so we'll talk about three main ones here. These all kind of stem and have kind of are almost the exact same law and act and have just been evolved over the years. So we'll start back with the first one in 1975. Um, and it was the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. And this is when uh, public schools started to receive federal funding um, for the students who have special needs. Um, now this doesn't always mean that they have the exact same special need. It doesn't mean that they're given the exact same services. It just means that federal funding is given to them for the schools to make those decisions and spend that, those monies based upon the the students that they have in their schools. Um, and when we are talking with students with disabilities, we're talking ages 3 to 21. And this led the way for other laws um, to provide services for special needs students. Also, since federal funding was now being provided, it also had disallowed schools to turn students away because of a disability. So they're not able to say, hey, you have so-and-so disability, we don't have the money or the funds, the resources to support that, so you can't go to school here. Um, they can't do that because they do have federal funds. So they may say, hey, you have this disability, we currently don't have the fun uh, we currently don't have the resources for that, but let us look into and we'll, you know, use our federal funding to get those resources to support um, your particular student and their particular needs. So moving on forward into 1990, we have the Americans with Disability Act. Now this branched beyond education. Um, education was a part of it, but it was more than that. Um, and it focused on um, prohibiting discrimination against people with disabilities, especially in public arenas, which of course includes public education. But this also involves transportation, communication, public venues, that kind of thing. So this is where the um, mandated handicap doors and walkways, um, those type things, handicap bathrooms, those type things came into play. So it was mandated that if it was a public venue, it had to have handicap accessible uh, materials and handicap accessible um, um, avenues for those. So then moving forward into uh, 2004, we have the Individuals with Disability Act or the IDEA Act. Um, and this was kind of stemming from what we've talked about in the past. It ensures that all students despite their disability have access to a free appropriate public education. So free means that they do not have to pay for any special services that they might need because of their disability. Um, so all those accommodations will be paid for through federal funding. Um, and it has to be appropriate, meaning that the students will be educated in the area closest to their normal peers and so that means least restrictive so um, if we have a student that has a disability we're going to try our best to educate him in the regular classroom with his regular peers rather than put him in a, a self-contained classroom with only other people with a disability so the idea is to keep them with their peers um, doing doing age-appropriate activities um, you know going to going to special um, going to the activities the the research Source classes, art, um, music, that kind of thing, um, and being able to be educated with the regular curriculum as much as possible. Now, sometimes students are not able with disabilities are not able to be successful with the regular curriculum, so in that case, those things are adjusted. But the goal is to keep them with their peers, their regular peers, as much as possible. It also means that they need to have a due process to be determined for their special services. So not one person, the teacher just can't say yes or no, they need special services. They have to go through a process. So they have to be tested, interventions have to be tried, and then eventually um, if they do qualify, those are they are given special services based upon the decisions from a committee. So it's a due process, not just a one and done thing. So we'll actually talk about IDEA a little bit more in a minute, but those, I just wanted you to see the progression from starting in 1975 to now and now and into the future, how, um, how laws and acts have affected education and special education specifically. Okay, so somewhat related to special education, but... Um, moving beyond just, just the principles of that into technology, it's the Assistive Technology Act of 2004. Um, it does uh, relate to special education, but it defines assistive technology as any item, equipment, or product system. Um, they can be commercially off the shelf, or it can be something that's been modified or customized um, to increase, maintain, or imp improve the function 
functional capabilities of students with disabilities. So it's important to note that it can be customized or it can be just straight off the shelf. It's also important to know that it doesn't have to be something, a technology that's very complex. It doesn't have to be a whole system, a whole iPad, a whole computer. It can just be very simple um, technologies, um, you know, just a pen that records what somebody's saying or, you know, special, special colorized, um, special colorized note-taking pens that can help them with color coding information. It doesn't necessarily have to be what we think of as quote-unquote technology. It can be just very simple basic. It just all depends on what the student needs. Um, and federal funding is used to uh, provide this, uh, this service, but it's not just the actual product equipment or item itself that can be used to purchase with federal funding. Federal funding can also be used to conduct the research about the technology to try to figure out what technology is going to work for this particular student. Um, it can be also used to, of course, purchase the item, and it can be also used to provide training for the item, which is a big deal, because if it is a specialized equipment that no one else in the school knows how to use, they need to have two or three people um, trained on how to use the product so that they can teach the student how to use it and keep it maintenance and that kind of thing. So, um, a fee, you know, uh, a lot of the federal funding can also be used to provide training. So this was designed to ensure that students with special needs were given um, or loaned devices that might improve their functionality or academic ability with little or no cost. So sometimes the equipment is given to them um, to be used over several years, and then sometimes it's just loaned to them for the school year, um, and then they reevaluate the next year. So a couple of points to, to keep in mind about this is um, it might be it, it, an advanced technology piece, it might be a simple technology piece, it can be uh, something right, right off the shelf or modified. Um, it can involve the purchasing of, of the item as well as training as well as conducting research about it. Um, and it can be loaned or given to the student. All right, so the next is the Bilingual Education Act, and it recognized that students, uh, that, that we had a population in America of some students with ling limited English speaking ability. Um, you also hear these called ESOL students, English as a Second Language students, ELL students, English language learner students. Um, so you hear these, these this group of students uh, by different names, but essentially they are students who are learning English as they are going to school in America, which obviously are speaking English to do their teaching with. Um, so this uh, act provides federal funding and grants to improve the programs for those with limited English speaking ability so that they're able to continue in their regular classroom and learn their regular, um, regular curriculum, science, math, English, social studies, all that stuff, while also learning English and being able to function in that classroom while everyone's speaking English. So this one has been modified from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Like many of these acts, it's just, it started in, back in the day and it's been modified and updated as needed. Um, it defined bilingual education as providing instruction in English and in the native language. Um, so, you know, Spanish, French, whatever the student happens to speak initially, um, so that the student can participate in the regular English speaking classroom as much as possible. Because because um, looking at bilingual education as well as special education, the overall goal is to get the student and keep the student in the regular education classroom with their non-disabled peers or their English speaking peers as much as possible. So next we have the National School Lunch Act, which brought about what you all are probably familiar with, which is low cost or free school lunch to qualified students. And qualified students um, is defined as students who parents make a cert below a certain threshold um, of money annually. So there is a form that they have to fill out showing that they make below a certain amount of money every year. Um, and in that case, they might qualify for low cost, which is a reduced cost for the lunch or free lunch altogether. So this was created through the National School Lunch Program. Um, it also, a lot of the students who qualify for free and reduced lunch during the regular school um, School period also qualify for the summer food service program, which is where um, either on the last day of school they are provided with like a box of of non perishable food items that they are that they they take home with them over the summer so that they have it to to eat over the summer. Or um, sometimes it is done to where every week um, the parents can come and pick up, or it can be delivered to them um, a set of of fooding items for the week. And so sometimes they do it just one lump at the end 
to school to last all summer. Sometimes they do it per week. Um, but it is basically giving giving food uh, to the students so that they have something, um, know that they have nutrition over the summer. So the funding is provided by USDA for free meals and can be subsidized by the school itself. Um, a lot of this was brought about by um, as you will learn, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of of um, Maslow's hierarchy and taxonomy, um, which is basically you start at the bottom of a pyramid, and it's basically saying that students have certain needs that they must have met before they can move up to other needs. And so, the very bottom of the the pyramid is students must have regular food, um, shelter, the ability to breathe healthy bodies to be able to learn in advance and so if we are not giving students basic nutrition if they're coming into the school and they don't have basic nutrition they're not going to be able to learn and prosper because their focus is going to be on their hungry bellies um, which makes sense and so uh, that is why we do provide the uh, low cost and free school lunch um, as well as breakfast this includes breakfast as well um, so that students will meet that basic need of not being hungry so they can continue further in being um, being able to, to, be, to focus on schoolwork and be successful. So now let's look at, look at Title IX, which is part of an education amendment from 1972. Title IX is a piece of it. Um, this includes lots of different things. Um, it focuses on the ideas that, that schools receive federal funding, um, and therefore they cannot discriminate based upon sex or gender, including one's gender identity. So it's, you know, male, female, but it's also how a student identifies. So there's, you know, a range and a um, continuum, if you will, of gender identities that people can identify with. So basically it says that if a school provides federal funding, they cannot discriminate on any of those genders or sexes. Um, so school must be proactive in providing resources and trainings to prevent sexual discrimination. Uh, so they have to provide resources. A lot of times they provide training, um, little little uh, trainings that they have to do before they're hired, little trainings they have to do at the beginning of school to make sure that, that teachers are able to um, identify sexual discrimination among students, among teachers, among teachers, among teachers, teachers among students, students among students, that kind of thing, and know how to report it. Um, they also must have a, a procedure for handling complaints of sexual violence or harassment. Um, also, the filing of this complaint cannot be retaliated against. And so, say that a teacher um, feels like they have been sexually harassed by another teacher. They report that. Um, when they report it, they know that they cannot be uh, retaliated against. So, say that it comes back and the teacher um, they, they find in favor of the teacher and the other one is punished, okay, so that they don't find in ta favor of the teacher and the, te the other teacher is not punished, um, the, they cannot retaliate. So in that case, it, it works um, more appropriately with someone being a, um, a boss. So say that you have a teacher who feels sexually discriminated by a boss, say the principal, they report it to HR, they find out that it's not a thing, the principal cannot retaliate onto the teacher for that. Um, schools cannot discourage other students from attending school or participating in extracurricular activities based upon their gender or sex. So they can't say, hey, we really have a great football team and we put all of our resources in our male football team. We've got this girl's basketball team. It's not really a big deal. We encourage you not to do it because we're not, we really don't want a whole lot of people there to provide and we really don't want to have to provide a lot of funding for it. So you can't discriminate or uh, discourage students from doing one or the other. Um, another issue, especially in high schools and in college level, um, and I guess in some middle schools, is the pregnancy issue which is covered by Title IX, um, and it basically uh, states that pregnant students have equal rights to their free appropriate public education and cannot be discriminated on against based upon the special services needed for their health. So um, if a pregnant student has to be out for a doctor's appointment, they cannot uh, punish the student, not let them make up their work, that kind of thing. Um, when a pregnant student, you know, goes out and has her baby, say it's in the middle of the school year, um, they have to make accommodations for that, either allow her to do her work at home while she is with her baby before she returns, allow her to make it up when she gets back, allow her to go to summer school to make it up, that kind of thing. They do have to work with the student to be able to um, to help them and to, to help them go through that. They treat it like any other health issue that um, a student might have.
Also, athletic programs must provide equal opportunities for both sexes and genders. Now, this is important to, to note. It's not always the exact same. So just because we have a male football team does not mean we have to have a female football team. Or it doesn't mean that we because we have a male basketball team, we have to have a female basketball team. That's not exactly what it means. It means we have to spend the same amount of monies, resources, energies, um, advertising, that kind of thing. So it's perfectly fine to have a football team for the guys and a softball team for the girls. Um, and not have the equivalent. That's okay. As long as you're spending the same amount of money and resources um, in marketing, then you are giving fair treatment to, to both sides. So again, the Title IX covers lots of different things. Mainly it's related to sexual violence or harassment, but it does include pregnancy and it does include um, making sure not to discriminate on gender. All right, moving on to the National Defense Act of 1958. This was put into effect by the President Eisenhower, and during this time, um, we had a space race, and it was the race to go into um, space. So there were several different countries trying to be the first to go into space. Um, obviously, Russia was the first one with Sputnik, um, and so the Soviets were the first one in in space. And America took that really hard. They wanted to be the first one. They thought they were so advanced compared to other countries. They should have been the first one into space. Um, and so they took a hard hit with that. And one of the things is they had a fear of, so this brought about the National Defense Act, which changed the curriculum within the school. Um, at that time because because we lost the space race we had a fear that we were falling behind in our educational competitions um, with other countries and so we really started putting funding into science math engineering and foreign language courses um, especially for our high school students because that is you know what lost us the space races is, is the math and the science and the engineering and that kind of thing so we really put a focus on that um, and provided more funding for those as well as provided more funding for those who are planning to attend college because the idea was not to let something like this happen again and to make sure that we were on the competitive edge in terms of STEM courses, science, math, engineering, um, technology, that kind of thing. So lastly, let's circle back back around to the Individuals with Disability Act from 2004. We started off with that. That was the most recent one, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about that and go into more detail. So it did start out as the Educational Education for All Handicapped Children Act in 1975 and was just further defined over the years. Um, it is designed to prevent protect the rights of students with disabilities um, and it includes several different things but one of the main things is a free appropriate public education uh, meaning that families won't pay for special services that the child needs to be successful um, parents have a say in the services that are given to their students so students who um, are determined to have a special need they are given an IEP which is an education an, an individualized education plan which a committee comes forth including the parent so that's the point here is that the parents and Involved. The parent, the teacher, the principal, the special education uh, teachers all have a meeting and they write basically a plan. Uh, they, they fill out a template and it's a plan of what this student's going to be able to accomplish, how they're going to differentiate from the regular students in the course, um, in, the, in the regular students in the classroom, what special services they're going to get, how long they're going to get those special services, and what goals they're going to have because their goals and check marks and benchmarks might be different than the regular education classroom. So um, we make this educational plan for them. This students uh, the parent is involved in that if the student is old enough they're also involved in it if they're like high school level um, also there are early intervention services for young students fitting their criteria there is a special area pre-k to where students can actually come to school early and start getting some of those special services early on um, before they actually begin school and students must be educated based uh, as much with their non-disabled peers as possible which again is called their least restrictive environment and the idea is that they're with their their non-disabled peers as much as possible and they do get those special services. Sometimes they can get them right within the regular classroom. Sometimes they do have to get pulled out for a little bit of time. But again, the overall goal is for them to be among their age-related peers as much as possible. So those are the main frameworks of how we define special education based upon the IDEA Act of 2004.